Dear colleagues, as we unfortunately have to cancel this year's World Congress in Montreal, we thought it would be a good idea to at least share some highlights from the virtual Congress that took place in February. Before the video starts, I would like to announce that the 2022 World Congress in Taipei, Taiwan will take place from June 9th to the 12th. I look forward to seeing you there in person and now please enjoy the video. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel below for free so you can watch more videos in the next weeks. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Naomi Feinberg, and the title of my talk today is Clinical Focus and Frontiers, Therapeutics of OCD. And so in today's lecture, I want to distill from that position statement the therapeutic advances judged by this international group of experts to be of utmost relevance to the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder based on new and emerging evidence from clinical and translational science, touching upon optimizing first line treatments, novel forms of functional intervention, early intervention and staging models, and then moving on to treatment resistant OCD, looking at novel pharmacotherapies, immunological therapies, and neurostimulation approaches, ultimately working toward a more personalized form of care. When we think about therapeutics, we're thinking about research enhanced healthcare. And of course, that requires a balance between the research evidence, so the evidence based medicine approach, with the clinical state and circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I have some slides about that. The COVID pandemic is, a, is, a, is something we have to deal with. Balanced alongside patient preferences and actions that can determine how we decide to treat our patients. Looking at the evidence-based medicine approach here, this slide summarizes the evidence-based interventions for the ICD-11 obsessive compulsive and related disorders. As I'm sure Professor Zohar will have discussed with you, OCD now sits at the head of this group of obsessive compulsive and related disorders listed down the left-hand side of your screen. Remember in ICD-11, hypochondriasis has been included in this grouping of disorders. And I've picked out in the slide in bold those treatments for which we have what you might call class 1A evidence of efficacy or effectiveness based on uh, large scale randomized controlled trials of fair comparison or a positive meta analysis. And so you can see that the, the weight of evidence lies in the domain of obsessive compulsive disorder for which the first line treatments of, for which we have an evidence base include SSRI, which is uh, most effective given at high doses, clomipramine, or in the case of treatment resistant patients, adjunctive antipsychotic. As far as the psychological treatment is concerned, uh, the evidence base seems to favour exposure and response prevention uh, as a behavioural form of CBT. In the case of OCD, as opposed to the other disorders, we now have randomized control trial evidence for the effectiveness of ablative neurosurgery, including cingulotomy and capsulotomy, uh, invasive neurostimulation in the form of deep brain stimulation and repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. I think the strength of opinion is still that these treatments should be viewed as largely exper experimental. And so for that reason, I, I haven't emboldened them. As we move down the list of OCRDs, you see that the first line treatments seem to change. So while body dysmorphic disorder and hypochondriasis seem to respond similarly to OCD, though we have much less evidence to support that. As we move down to hoarding disorder, the truth is for hoarding disorders, very little treatment that seems to be practically effective uh, and hair pulling and skin picking disorders, otherwise thought of as body focused habit disorders, do not seem to respond to SSRI and clomipramine in the same way as OCD. And so we've been looking for other treatment modalities that might help. And for them, 
uh, medications that act on dopamine systems or opiate systems, talking perhaps to the more impulsive or addictive nature of these disorders may be more helpful. And also the form of T CBT shifts from exposure and response prevention type strategies to a more behavioral, even more behavioral form of habit reversal therapy, breaking the link between stimulus and action. So how do patients do with the standard first line treatments of OCD? Well, I refer back now a few years to this seminal study by Jane Eisen and her group in the United States who recruited over 200 adults with OCD and prospectively followed them up in what at the time was state-of-the-art treatment and probably still represents state-of-the-art treatment with uh, medication and CBT and what she found is what I believe is likely to still be the case that only 40% of our patients actually enter remission even in the best clinical hands. For those who do well a shorter duration of illness predict predicts a better response and those as I've mentioned with primary hoarding do particularly badly. But here is the rub. If you're fortunate to be in the 40% of patients who've entered remission within five years, there's a 60% chance that you're likely to relapse. And relapse can be very damaging, as, as evidence tells us, in terms of loss of quality of life over so many psychosocial domains. Those with an obsessive compulsive personality disorder, so maximum cognitive inflexibility, were more than twice as likely to relapse, uh, suggesting that treatments targeting cognitive inflexibility are going to be really important in OCD. And also those who only entered a partial remission were more likely to relapse than those who entered a full remission, talking the importance of getting people really well and optimising first line care. Moving on then to duration, oops, duration of illness. This is something that bedevils the treatment of OCD because patients with OCD are pretty secretive and they don't come forward for treatment and they have very long durations of illness and untreated illness. In this study by Bernardo Del Osso, who just reviewed the stated durations of illness of patients presenting for treatment in trials, we have on the y-axis the duration, which is in months, and we see that the duration of illness in the pale grey lasts in many cases more than 10 years, often up to 20 years. And in the dark grey, the duration of untreated illness represents about half of that time. So we're dealing with patients who've had seven to 10 years of untreated illness before we even start. What about the role of inflammation? For many years, we've thought inflammation is very important in the etiology of OCD. And I've just highlighted Susuido seminal work looking at PANDAS, and more recently, Pediatric Acute Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, PANS. Um, in the last few years, we've uh, moved to PET scanning, which has demonstrated evidence of inflammation in terms of microglial activation in that corticostriatothalamical circuitry that I just showed you, suggesting that inflammation may play a role. A very intriguing post-mortem recent study by Lisboa and colleagues that brings together genetic and tissue sampling, showing that there's an enrichment of genes associated with the immune response and cytokines in the chordate nucleus of patients with OCD. Talking to the possibility that anti-inflammatory medication could be effective, and we do have some small positive RCTs of anti-inflammatory agents. So we have a couple of positive studies of celecoxib, a COX-2 inhibitor, suggesting that might be worth uh, exploration. Uh, one positive study of minocycline, the antibiotic, though a negative open label study, so inconsistent results there, and also inconsistent results on, on N-acetylcysteine, which in addition to its glutamate functions may act as an anti-inflammatory on prostaglandins. Unlike the other anti-inflammatories on this slide, N-acetylcysteine is thought to cross the blood-brain barrier more efficiently, but as you can see when we look at the results of the studies, there's a lot of inconsistency and not all of them were positive. In conclusion then, um, when we're looking at optimizing treatment for OCD, we think combination treatment is likely to be more effective, but the advantages of combining treatment remain unclear. As this is a more costly form of treatment, we need more randomized controlled trials. Early intervention is likely to improve outcomes, but there is a limitation of existing treatment approaches. 
There may be a role for adjunctive functional interventions. Inflammation remains a promising target. And there is clearly a very exciting emerging role for neurostimulation, both in terms of non-invasive, low frequency RTMS or high frequency deep TMS to the prefrontal cortex may be effective, but we really do need well-powered replication studies. The idea of personalized uh, alternating currents to the orbitofrontal cortex is also a very interesting and exciting uh, avenue to explore, possibly along the range of obsessive compulsive related disorders, including hoarding. And then when it comes to implanting electrodes, uh, we may be differentially able to differentially improve depressed mood and cognitive flexibility alongside OCD in highly refractory disorders, all setting the groundwork for the development of personalized circuit-based therapeutics for obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. At that point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be delighted to answer any of your questions.